Hey, NCBC family and friends. Want to thank you for tuning in this week. We just want to say a special happy anniversary, happy 46th anniversary to Lawrence and Dottie Miles. Thank you guys for being such a great part of our church and such, such instrumental uh, members of New Creation. We also want to just say we, we had such a great time. Our first time doing our drive up communion, we want to do it again. So September 6th, we're going to do another drive up communion at 6.30 p.m. Mark your calendars, 6.30 p.m. September 6th. Also, just want to remind everybody, we still have Sunday school going on. If you can, please take the time out and tune in via Zoom. We have Bible study on Wednesday nights and a prayer call every Thursday at 8 p.m. So please continue to be a part, be involved. Don't get tired. I know we want to be together. I know we want to uh, be back at church. And, and this, this COVID has really got us tired, but but just, just continue to stay faithful to, to each other and to, to being a part of our body. Thank you all. I miss you so much. Can't wait for the drive up communion so I can see and lay my eyes on your beautiful faces. God bless you and God keep you. Oh, today's message will be brought by none other than our very own Pastor John Bray. So let's be in prayer for him as he brings us the word. God bless you and God keep you. Oh, good morning. It's a pleasure for me to be here. If you would open your Bibles to the book of Philemon right after 1st, 2nd, and 1st and 2nd Timothy and Titus, and right before Hebrews is the little epistle to Philemon. We're going to be coming out of Philemon today. Uh, as I often do, I'm going to read the text, and then I'll pray, and then we will get started with our message. In Philemon, verse 8 says this, Therefore, although in Christ I could be bold and order you to do what you ought to do, Yet I appeal to you on the basis of love. I then, as Paul, an old man and now also a prisoner of Christ Jesus, I appeal to you for my son, Onesimus, who became my son while I was in chains. Formerly, he was useless to you, but now he has become useful both to you and to me. I am sending him, who is my very heart, back to you. Would, I would uh, like to keep him with me that he could take your place in helping me while I am in chains for the gospel. But I did not want to do anything without your consent so that any favor you do will be spontaneous and not forced. Perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a little while was that you might have him back for good, no longer as a slave, but better than a slave. As a dear brother, he is very dear to me, but even dearer to you, both as a man and as a brother in the Lord. So if you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. If he has done uh, you any wrong or owes you anything, charge it to me. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will pay it back. Not to mention that you owe me your very self. I do wish, brother, that I may come so and have some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you knowing that you will do even more than I ask. Please pray with me. Father God, we just thank you, Lord, for giving us this opportunity to dive into your text. Lord, I just ask that you would uh, bless me, bless the hearers of this message. Lord, um, let us understand what the Bible is saying to us, to us. Let us understand what you are speaking from the throne room of heaven. Lord, I, my hope and my prayer is that this message will speak to the issues of today. Let, uh, let me communicate the relevance of this text and let my hearers understand the relevance of this text so that we might grow and be more in the image of Jesus Christ, more, uh, more, made more and more Christ-like in our approach to life. And Lord, we want to be more and more Christ-like in our approach to you. Uh, now, Father, we just are thanking you for these and many other blessings in the matchless and priceless name of your dear son, Jesus Christ, and all of God's people said, amen. Thank you, Lord. Uh, America today has absolutely 
unequivocally lost its mind. The, the world today, America today, is tipping out of balance and something has to be done. See, liberals are fighting with conservatives. Republicans are fighting with Democrats. Black people are fighting with white people. And men and women, they're fighting each other. The world has lost its mind. See, we have this nasty habit of talking to people who don't look like I look and don't look like you look, and we tend to look down on those people, and we tend to have uh, prejudices against those people, and we have to stop doing that, especially in the church. See, it was all sparked by the tragedy of George Floyd in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and the resulting protests that happened immediately after that, and the whole city and the whole nation is burning to the ground. See, everyone is searching for an answer. And I've heard uh, uh, that we desperately want to know what the truth of all of this, what does all of this mean for us? Is it true that black lives matter or do all lives matter? Well, we as Christians and what we believe in all things should come from, most importantly, should come from the mind of God, not from our feelings. See, I, I want to just let you know that I, I don't have any solutions. I, 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 I don't have the answers, but I know who does. That's the God of the Bible. What I have heard, see, I, I, I've heard lots of people talking and lots of people giving their understandings and lots of people saying what they think is going to be the solution to this problem. But what I have not heard yet is one biblical solution to this problem. So will you join me today as we take a look at what really is an overlooked book of the Bible and the way that it powerfully answers the questions that many people are asking today? We're going to take a look at the book of Philemon, and we're going to, uh, the title that uh, God laid on my heart is A Biblical Cure for Worldly Assumptions. If you have to have a title, it would be A Biblical Cure for Worldly Assumptions. Look in your Bible at Philemon, verse 8. In the text, in verse 8, Paul begins his plea to his friend uh, uh, um, uh, Philemon, or excuse me, Paul begins his plea to Philemon uh, for his friend Onesimus. And he says, therefore, now as good Bible students, I, I want you to understand, whenever you see the word therefore, it's going to take you back to what was there before. And Paul is going to go on to say this in verse 7. It just explains a little bit about what he's talking about. He says this to uh, uh, Philemon. Paul says, your love has given me great joy and encouragement because you, brother, have refreshed the hearts of the Lord's people. See, it's because of this that Paul could say that, that he could order, in a sense, Philemon to do uh, what he wanted him to do. He, in, in some, translations, some translations, it even says to do what is proper. Philemon might not have wanted to do this. He might not have been happy to do this. But Paul says, hey, I want you to do this and you need to do this. Paul was going to ask him to do it Anyway, why? Because Paul has the authority. Paul is an apostle of Jesus Christ. So look at verse 9. It says this. I want you to just see the end of verse 9. It says, yet I appeal to you on the basis of love. That's the first takeaway, brothers and sisters. It's on the basis of love that Paul is writing to this man, that Paul is going to ask this man to do what he's going to ask him to do. Everything that Paul is doing is coming from a basis of love. See, it's the basis of love that will not allow you, not allow me to hold another man, another woman as a slave. 
See, the basis of love will not let us look at another man or another woman and say that they are less than me. If you have true love, that could never happen. See, we can't do that as Christians. And you want to know why? If you go back to the very first book of the Bible, Genesis chapter one, you can turn to Genesis chapter one. And I want you to see something when you get to Genesis chapter one. I want you to take a look at verses 25, 26 and 27. We're going to specifically look at verse 27. 27 says this. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God. He created them both male and female he created them. So I want to tell you, brothers and sisters, if you're here listening to this message today, you are in the image of almighty God. No one can take that away from you. No one can snatch that out of your hands. Remember that no matter how bad you feel, you are an image bearer of God. See, that same God spoke and that same God spoke to the children of Israel as he freed them. And, and, and Moses came down from the top of the mountain and gave them commandments. And God gave them commandments throughout the Old Testament. And these commandments were repeated by our Lord Jesus Christ. When he was asked by one of the teachers of the law in Mark 12, turn to Mark 12 if you want to. Mark chapter 12, verse 28 through 21 the Bible says this, we see this exchange between Jesus and one of the teachers of the law. One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating, noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer. He asked them, he says this, of all the commandments, which one is the most important? Which, which one, Jesus, are, is going to sum up all of the law? Which commandment is the sin non or the essence of the law? The most important one, answer Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. And the second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Brothers and sisters, see what has to happen is if you want to understand that if we're going to deal with this, these racial injustices, these racial issues, this racial tension that's going on in America, you have to love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself. See, there has to be a love for God and a love for neighbor. And when you understand that, you will understand that your neighbor is just like you. They might look different. They might sound different. They might come from a different country. But if you cut anybody here in America, they're going to bleed red, just like you. It doesn't matter what color they are. No matter what they, uh, no matter what religion they are, no matter anything that you can think of that will separate you from them, it does not matter. They're a human being made in God's image. See, this is the kind of love that I'm talking about that we have to have. This is the kind of love that Jesus is talking about and tells us that we have to have. Do you love people like this? Jesus says this, he says, a new commandment I give to you, love one another as I have loved you. Can you love somebody as much as Jesus loves them? It's a command. You must love one another. He says, but by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. In John, in 1 John, excuse me, 3, verses 16 and 17, Jesus, or excuse me, the Apostle John says this. This is uh, how we know what love is. Do you want to know what love is? I'm going to tell you right now. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. 
And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and our sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or a sister in need and has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in that person? Do you love people? Are you willing to sacrifice for people? Are you willing to go out of your way to make another person's day better? Can we love one another to this degree? Or better, better yet, a better way to say that is, can we love God enough that we will love another to this degree? And it doesn't matter whether they're a believer, whether they're your brother and sister in Christ, or they're an unbeliever, a pagan. They could be the most uh, worst cursing person you've ever seen in your life. We are still called to love them because they're still our neighbor. See, if we love like this, there is no way for you or me to have hatred in our hearts towards another man or another woman. And when we can do this, we're going to look and we're going to see and we're going to understand that we are all the same person. We're all the same being. We're all the same human beings. There's no difference between us. Shaquille O'Neal is seven foot tall and Ruth Bader Ginsburg is little tiny. He's not greater than she is. She's not greater than he is. They're both human beings. You want to see how Paul carries this love out? Just keep reading. Look at what he says in the rest of the verse. Go back to verse uh, nine. Go back to the middle. Paul says, and uh, it is as none other than Paul. He says, I'm an old man now and a prisoner of Christ Jesus. He's in chains that I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, who became my son while I was in chains. Formerly, he was useless to you, but now he has come, become useful both to you and to me. So Paul's been doing ministry for a long time. He's an old man now. He's getting ready to die. And he's a prisoner for preaching the gospel. Lord, count us all worthy to be persecuted for preaching the gospel. But Onesimus, and this is the funny thing, that name Onesimus, it actually means useful. Paul is saying that this uh, Mr. Useful Onesimus has become useless to you. So Mr. Useful Onesimus has become useless. Paul is clear, but he says to him later that he's going to become useful to you again. He says, Paul says, he knows that what Onesimus might have done to Philemon was wrong. He knows that. But Paul says, because he loves him, he wants Philemon to let Onesimus go back to where he ran away from. Onesimus was a runaway slave. Paul says, consider him now not just a slave, but a brother in Christ. And he's going to become useful to you again. See, the body of Christ can only function if we view one another as equally sharing in God's grace and equally administering God's gifts to one another. Not only to ourselves, but to everyone in the congregation, to everyone out there that we meet. It's when we operate in God's will that the outside world will look at us and it will say that God is truly among his people. When they when they see us operating in love and see us walking in love, they will be drawn to us because they will say there is something different about that brother. There is something different about that sister. I just got to know what it is because the world does not have love. But the body of Christ should have love. Let your love for God and your love for others flow through you and you will have taken the first steps in dismantling the hatred that we all have for somebody that we know. 
But Paul's not done. He's not done. He says this. Look at verse 12. Paul says that he is sending Mr. Useful right back to Philemon, Onesimus. Now, people who believe that slavery is taught in the Bible, here's the problem. People that believe that slavery is condoned in the text will say, see, Paul didn't send, he say he was free right there. Why did Paul send him back to his slave master? That sounds kind of like bad for Christians, right? But here's the problem when people say that. I want you to do one simple thing if somebody brings that objection up to you. I want you to tell them this simple, simple phrase. Keep reading. Let's keep reading. Look at verse 13. Paul tells us why he thought that Onesimus was useful. He was helping Paul. But look at the verse, and we can see how he was helping him. Verse 13 says, I would like to have, uh, excuse me, I would have liked to keep him with me so that he could take your place in helping me while I am in chains. Here's the word for the gospel. To the Apostle Paul, everything was a gospel issue. Everything. It didn't matter how he ate, how he slept, how he walked, how he talked. It's all gospel. And that's the second key. That's the second takeaway. And when he wrote this, Paul was in chains. Don't forget that. He's trying to get a slave set free while he is in chains. And he wants Philemon to know. Even though he is physically, literally physically bound, his heart and his mind are as free as they could ever be. That's how precious the gospel is, brothers and sisters. If we can fully grasp the implications of what the gospel means for you, what the gospel means for me, we can never look at another person again and say that they are less than us. I want you to turn to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 7. It says that we should... Hold on to Jesus as precious because he's the gospel. The same thought is expressed in the Old Testament in Isaiah 28, verse 5. The life changing message of the gospel, brothers and sisters, is so, so powerful that the Apostle Paul said this. Woe unto me if I preach not the gospel. Paul says, I'm not coming to you talking about me. I'm not coming to you talking about you. I preach the gospel. Because that's what it's all about. It's about preaching the word of God. Paul even says this to the church at Galatia. Now, that church had a lot of issues. It doesn't start off like most epistles. There's not a nice, friendly greeting. But Paul goes on to say this to that church. He says, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to, the li to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to what? A different gospel, which really is no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel different than the one we have preached to you, let that person be accursed. I said it and I'm going to say it again. If I come to you, if an angel comes to you and they preach a gospel different, let them be under God's curse. Paul was not playing with the gospel. The gospel is serious business. The gospel is the power of God that brings salvation, is what Romans 1.16 says. The word, the work of the gospel should be our focus. And I believe at New Creation, it is our focus. We're gospel people, gospel centered people, gospel minded people. And that's one of the reasons that we're here. We preach the gospel to ourselves and we preach the gospel to others. 
it drove the Apostle Paul's life. Once he was knocked off his horse on the way to Damascus, from that point on, it was gospel, 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 gospel for Paul, and that's the way we should be too. Now, Paul knows that he needs Onesimus' help in spreading the gospel. But he says to Philemon, look at verse 14. But, but, but I did not want to do anything without your consent. So that any favor you do would not be forced, but it would be voluntary. I, I wanted you to do this freely, Philemon. So Paul was not exerting apostolic authority. Because Paul loves both Philemon and Onesimus. Paul's appealing to Philemon on the basis of love for the gospel's sake. Do you see that? I want you to understand that. He says he is not going to force the issue if Philemon does not understand it. He's not going to make him do this. But if you understand the gospel principles that you were saved under and you've got love in your heart, Philemon, for your, for your fellow man, let Onesimus go. Paul would even say that he didn't desire to twist Philemon's arm behind his back. That's a play on words when the Bible says any favor you would do would not seem forced. That not seem forced is the, the picture of twisting somebody's arm behind their back. He says, I don't want to do that to you. I want it to come from your heart because it's a gospel issue. That word is so important here. Paul continues and says in verses 15 and 16, perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a little while was that you might have him back forever. And here's the key, no longer as a slave. Philemon had legal rights to Onesimus. Slavery was such a part of Roman culture in the first century that it was just it was unspoken. It was just known. Philemon had every right to demand Onesimus back, and he could beat him, whip him, kill him if he wanted to. But Paul says he's coming back forever, and he is no longer a slave. Remember that objection before? People that don't keep reading in their text, see, they're not going to see, they're not going to understand what's being said because they want to read one verse or one sentence and say that's what the Bible teaches. They don't read the entire context. He's not a slave anymore, Philemon. Because of the loving effects of the gospel message, he is completely, he is a completely different person. He is no longer that man that stole something from you and ran away. He's a child of the same God you believe in, Philemon. You two are brothers. Paul even says that. He's not a slave. Onesimus is now, but better than a slave, as a dear brother. That's what the text says. He's a dear brother. Do, do, do you have a brother? Do you have a sister? I, I, I do. And I, and I love my sister. There is almost, almost nothing that I would not do for my sister. How could I want anything bad to happen to my sister? How could I want anything bad to happen if I, to, 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 my, to my brother? How could I want anything bad to happen to you? I would never want anyone to serve me that way. I don't want anyone to be a slave of John Bray. What does that even sound? That doesn't even sound right. I don't need anyone to serve me. That's what Paul's saying. He, he's not a slave. He's your brother. See, the gospel makes us into brothers and sisters. You know that in the early church? They were even charged with incest because they went around calling one another brother and sister. The Roman people thought they were having they were literally brothers and sisters and they would give each other a kiss on the cheek when they would greet one another. And they said they are involved in crazy stuff over there in that Christian church. No, 
They had love for one another because they understood the gospel. The gospel makes us into brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you know that early believers thought that? I don't think did, I, when I read that, I was like amazed that they actually thought that. Are, are you preaching the gospel to yourself daily? Are you preaching the gospel to yourself when you wake up? Are you saying to yourself, I got out of bed and that's the grace of God. I put my feet on the floor and that's the grace of God. I got up and I stood up and I went to, to put my clothes on. That's the grace of God. Everything you do is the grace of God. Christ has loved you. Christ has loved you so much to die for you. Christ has loved you so much to die for you and present to you the gospel. And that gospel is why you are now free. To nail a point further, Paul is going to add this thought. Look what he says in verse 16. He says, he, Onesimus is very dear to me. He, he's very dear to me. But he's even dearer to you. Both as a fellow man, here's, here's the kicker, and as a brother in the Lord. See, slaves are property. Whatever you wanted to do, you could do to your slave. But Onesimus should be valuable to Philemon, not as a slave but as a man. He's equal to Philemon in every way. He is a man. He's also your brother in the Lord. How can, you, how can people say that the Bible does not address the slavery issue? The Bible does not address issues between men that are having problems because I look like this and you look like you. If you love me and have understood the gospel and I love you and I have understood the gospel, we should get along like peas and carrots. Paul, Paul was so wrapped up in the gospel, so desirous for people to understand the gospel that he, he, he never let the gospel message go. But I think 1 Peter is actually where I want to go to sum up this point. In 1 Peter chapter, uh, chapter 4, verse 8, it says this, Above all, love each other deeply, because love covers a multitude of sin. The gospel is the issue because the gospel message, because of the gospel message. Do you love God? Do you love God's people this way? Well, let's move on to our last point. Well, I want you to understand that loving people is important. I want you to understand that the gospel message is important. It's going to solve, if we can do this, if we can start in this church, um, loving people, preaching the gospel message to people. If we can start here, right now, right today, preach the gospel to yourself, love one another. If we can do that, we can start to build bridges between men and women. But there's one more thing we have to understand. And it is so key. And I'm glad that Paul, uh, when he wrote this letter, he, he put love first and then the gospel, and then he put this last. You know what that last component is? Forgiveness. You've got to have forgiveness in your heart. Look at verse 17, back in Philemon. The Bible says, so if you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. When Paul says that word partner, he, he's... He's saying, consider, consider him in this fellowship. If you consider me to be a part of what you've got going on here, Philemon, I want you to welcome him back. And the, the words you would, uh, you would welcome are not in the text. Welcome him back as you would me. As, as, excuse me. Welcome him back as me. Paul is saying, look, when, Philemon, when uh, Onesimus comes back, 
he, he's not coming back. If you've got a problem with him, Philemon, think of him as me coming back there. That's a gospel message. Because you know what happens when we die? God does not see our sin. He sees the righteousness of Christ. And Paul is saying, hey, it's a gospel issue, uh, uh, Philemon. Onesimus is coming back, and if you have a problem with him, don't see him, see me. It's sad that we just seem to misunderstand what forgiveness talks about. Forgiveness is letting it go when another has wronged you. Philemon is to forgive Onesimus. He stole from him. He was wrong as wrong could be. He took something that was not his and ran away. And Paul says, forgive him. It's your brother in the Lord. That's the third component. This is how we know it's about forgiveness. Look at verse 18. If he has done you any wrong or owes you anything, Paul says, charge it to me. Not only are you supposed to see me when you see him, if he's got anything that he owes you, he doesn't owe you, you can charge it to me. That's forgiveness. Paul says in verse 19 that he will pay it back. That's about forgiveness. The way that this sentence reads, it, su it suggests that it, it's true that Onesimus did something wrong to Philemon. We know that. But if Philemon has love for his brother and love for the apostle that saved him and understands the gospel message and understands what forgiveness is and has love in his heart, let it go. Let it go. Can you see how understanding these principles would lead a believer to, to, to act in such a way that holding another man in a lower position is impossible? If you love them, understand the gospel, and can forgive them, we're all equal. You know, I want you to think about this. We, we like to always think that we're innocent and that we don't need forgiveness. But uh, uh, we can forgive other people, but I, I've, I've never done anything. I've never done anything wrong, you know. If you don't think so, just ask my wife. Have you offended somebody? Is there somebody that, that you have upset by the way you have acted, by the things that you have said? We've all done it. It's natural. We're human beings. But when you do, go ask for forgiveness. And if they're a brother and sister in Christ, they should forgive you. See, we all know that verse in 1 John where it says he's faithful and just to forgive us of all of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We all like to quote that one, right? But let's not forget what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 6. Jesus says, for if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly father will forgive you. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. But then there's a problem. The verse says, but if you do not forgive others their sin, your father will not forgive you your sins. So holding on to, to anger and being mad at people and, and not forgiving people, it's going to hinder your understanding and your walk with God. It's going to hinder your walk with Christ. God will not forgive you if you cannot forgive others. It was and still is a sin for a person to think that he owns another person. That is one of the gravest sins you could ever think of, that you actually have rights to another human being's life. It's, in, it's unfathomable to me that somebody thinks they can own another person. Your skin color, your sex, does not determine who you are. That's not it. That's not what determines who you are. You are either in Adam or you are in Christ. You are either an unbeliever or you are a believer. You are either not in the church or you are in the church. You are either unsaved or you are saved. There are only two kinds of people in this world. 
That's it. Two. See, we think we're special. But I want you to hear what God said. The Lord God Almighty said to the children of Israel, because they were starting to think that they were special. He said, the Lord did not set his affection on you and choose you because you are more numerous than other people. No, 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 no. For you were the fewest of all the peoples that were out there. But it was because the Lord loved you. Deuteronomy 7, verses 7 and 8. That's in the Bible. He didn't choose Israel because Israel was great. He didn't choose you for salvation because you are great. You, me, us, we are wretched, dirty sinners in the eyes of God. But for the grace of God that sent Christ Jesus to the cross. Where would we be? That's why Paul could say this when you go back to Philemon in verse 19. He says, you know what? Not to mention that you owe me your very self. (laughs) The way this epistle ties these things together is absolutely amazing to me. Paul says what he's saying is that he knew who it was that had led him, that Philemon knew who it was that had led him to Christ. You know that I did this, right? You owe me your very self, Philemon. If you got an issue with with Onesimus, I'm going to have an issue with you. Then Paul says, confident of your obedience, I write to you knowing that you will do even more than I ask. He kind of puts the screws to him just a little bit more. (laughs) He's kind of giving him just a a little uh, apostolic nudge in the ribs. You're going to do this, right? See, Philemon, when confronted with the truth that Paul lays out, uh, he, he, he would have a, a motivated drive not only to let Onesimus go, but to do more than he asked. He might even be might even set the rest of his slaves that were believers free. I don't know. See, before we get too big for our britches, remember that we have been forgiven and therefore we should forgive others the same way. Forgiveness is the third thing. Love, gospel, forgiveness. As I close, brothers and sisters, I want to I want I want I want y'all to be aware of the issues that this little epistle is trying to make us known, known, known to us. That we're all people, we're all equal in God's eyes. Every one of us, we're all the same. We all bear his image. Because of that, you and I should have the kind of love for people that God has for them. It's that self-sacrificing, agape, God kind of love in verse 9. It's, it is, it's that kind of love that, uh, that will allow you and I to forgive someone for the wrong that they have done to us and allow us to, to, to ask for forgiveness for the wrongs that we have done to other people. We want to see that forgiveness in verse 18. And brothers and sisters, we can do that when we have played our part. If, if, if we can do that, we have played our part in presenting the gospel to people, not, not, not just to people out there, but to people in here And not only to people in here, but to ourselves. That's verse 13. Remember that all of life is a gospel issue. There's there's no way to get around it. Both in and out of the church. And that it is also the answer. The gospel is the answer to all the madness that is going on in the world today. See, we don't need more rallies. We don't need politicians. We don't need people yelling in each other's face. What we need is the gospel. Will you pray with me? Father, we thank you for giving us this time in your word. I just ask that you would bless my brothers and sisters as I hear this message. Lord, thank you for allowing me to uh, stand up and preach the message. And Father, we will give you all the praise, honor, and glory. We're just asking for this in the matchless name of your dear son, Jesus Christ. And all of God's people said, amen. Thank you, Lord.